Welcome to it, sports fans. The FTB TV podcast is with you again. Episode 19. It is the 17th of January. 17th of January, the FTB TV podcast from the bleachers. Back with you again for 2019. Only getting better. Only getting better. Welcome to it. Today we are going to deal with the big one, the story of the summer for sure. South African summer, English winter or Northern Hemisphere winter. Of course, Jose Mourinho departing Man United. And since then, they've gone six on the spin. So we'll talk about Paul, Paul Pogba post-Jose. What does that mean for United now? And what do I think it means for United in the future? Talk a little bit about uh, some cricket. Love a bit of test cricket, of course. Cricket is undergoing an immense change. I think we saw that this summer... Those who, who had the travesty of having to try and watch what was a, a series, if you can call it that, between Pakistan and South Africa. I apologize for that. But we'll talk about that. What does that mean? What is the, what is the face of cricket turning into? And what do I think should happen there? We'll have a word about that. Love test cricket, love cricket. We'll talk about what I think is happening between the ICC and fans. And then lastly... I'll finish off with my prediction for the Australian Open, the men's division. There I'll talk a little bit quickly about who I think is going to win. And I think it's pretty clear there. Remember to follow us on Podbean. And also head on over to iTunes if you're in the iTunes world. We are on iTunes, the FTB TV podcast. You can follow us there. Please go and rate us. Like, share, five stars. I've actually decided I don't want any negative feedback. Just give me five stars. That's it. Feed into my ego. I'm not a very, very confident person. So I need that. I need the extrinsic affirmation. So that's FTB, the FTB TV podcast. Let's get underway for today, the Thursday, the 17th of January. We're going to talk about Paul Pogba post Jose Mourinho. Specifically Pogba, post Mourinho. So listen to me, let me give you an analogy. And I've had this situation, I've been part of these situations, whether through friends or no people. But you know, you know when a lady's been divorced twice, right? And everyone tends to be on her side, just because that's how society is. And she's just unlucky, you know. She just has she hasn't met anybody and can't meet anybody who loves her and her son and she's just unlucky. You know how it goes. That's what we all say. Everybody wants to empathize with their friend and she's just unlucky. Her and her son are unlucky. They can't find somebody to love her and her son. You know she's been divorced twice now. She's unlucky. That's what the world says. Look we we, we live in a society where we go, you know, in every divorce the kids are the victims and they're never the cause. I can talk about this. I come from a home of divorce. So you can't tell me about it. We always say, my goodness, the kids are the victims in divorce. In this particular situation, nobody ever tells you that the mom constantly lets her son smoke at the age of 16 and allows him to go to nightclubs on school nights. And nobody ever talks about those details. It's always like, oh, she's just unlucky. It's never tough love. But you know, it's 2019 and the way the world functions today, she's still good looking. And you know, those guys that considered her amazing in high school, they're still around. And you know, the guys that didn't have access to the prettier girls in schools, we called them nerds back then. They're tech millionaires now. They're tech billionaires now. So nobody's inaccessible to them. Yes, it is a capitalist world, whether you like it or not. When people get married, it matters if people have money. And now the nerdy guys, they are Mark Zuckerberg. They can get married to anybody, to supermodels. It happens. Didn't happen 25 years ago, it happens now. If you're rich, it gives you access to other things. That you definitely didn't have in high school, my friend. You were a nerd then, they love you now. Everybody wants a yacht. Everybody wants to go to Dubai twice a year. So I said, lady, 
and her son, of course, marry the tech millionaire. And they get a great house, big house. He moves to private school now. Of course, it's the, you know, she's on to her third man marriage. And then, you know, at the age of about 43, she kind of realizes, ooh, I'm not sure I can get another husband off this because the looks start to fade around that age. And she's like, you know, I can learn to love Neville. Let's say his name is Neville's our tech nerd. Neville's a pretty nerdy name. And if, you're, if your name's Neville, you know I'm talking about you. So she can learn to love Neville, right? She's 43. She understands how this world works. After 43, ooh, tough to keep use, using your looks. Problem is, Neville's a disciplinarian. And the son starts acting out. Remember, he's been smoking at 16, going out to nightclubs. And for six months, Neville can tolerate it. He's with his dream girl. She couldn't access her in high school, but now he gets to be with his dream girl. But after six months, Neville's had enough. Files divorce papers. Neville serves, uh, Neville serves the divorce papers. A month in, she gets her settlement packages. They're out. Problem in this situation, after the third divorce, generally, takes two or three divorces before people start to go, mm, maybe this little kid who smokes in school uniform. Maybe this kid who's always at nightclubs going to school he he's, goes to mathematics and he's drunk in the morning he's got alcohol in his breath and he's 16 years old and the mom's facilitating that behavior maybe that's the issue maybe she's not so unlucky problem is by now the son knows every time i feel as though the authority is too much for me i act out my mom gets divorced and the pattern repeats itself I smoke at school, I drink, I go out, we get divorced, we move on. Man United have set a very, very dangerous precedent with Paul Pogba. Let me explain to you what I mean. They're on a six-game winning streak, and Pogba's looking like uh, Donna Donny, apparently. That's what I'm told. I've been watching it, maybe I've been watching, maybe my TV needs to be adjusted. You see, like, the unruly son in the divorce, the first two months, the unruly son will always be on his best behavior. But the thing about people is that if you give them time, they will revert back to who they are. Listen to me. Man United, after Paul Pogba's post, when Jose left, and there were all those weak excuses about he didn't know he was training, Pogba has a, he's got a, he's got a whole social media team. Trust me. We can all see that. Man United at that very moment could have made a choice. Pogba should have been fined a month's wages, so that's four weeks' wages, and he should have been banned for three games because for these guys, money isn't anything. For a guy like Paul Pogba, his salary and money is not the fine. How you find these top footballers is you stop them from playing football. That's what most of them love. What you do if you fine him a month's wages and you ban him for three games is that you send a message to the players that the club and the future manager are untouchable by the players. No matter how the players feel, just because you're unhappy as a player, you're at Manchester United now. You are nobody. You are nobody. Roy Keane, David Beckham, Jop Schnamm, Edwin van der Sar. They have all come and they have all gone. Manchester United continues to be the biggest brand in the world. This was Manchester United's opportunity to tell Paul Pogba that you cannot smoke in school uniform. You cannot go to the nightclub on a school night. And they missed it. And I'll tell you why they needed to drop the hammer. Is we can clearly see it now. It's coming out. Pogba is the dressing room leader. You look at the prominent players that Man United have. Lingard, Rashford, very much following in that model. Build the brand. Use United's brand. Lingard's launching his, his brand through being a United player. He's, he's launched his fashion brand. Talked about it on the last episode. He, he launched his fashion brand on the week of the Liverpool game. The biggest 
possibly the biggest derby in European football, give or take. I'll give you El Clasico, but it is certainly the biggest in British football, and it's close to the biggest maybe in, in world club football. Jesse Lingard decided, I'm going to launch my clothing brand that week. What does that tell you? That is all very much in the Paul Pogba mode. The problem for Man United now is that Paul Pogba is the dressing room leader. And we know with Pogba, it is clear now that football isn't always number one. Problem for United is there is no Vieira, there is no Keane, there is no Terry, there is no Tony Adams to control the change room and make football the focus. It's clear Pogba and Jose were at loggerheads and Pogba won. And now nobody can stop him. If Jose couldn't stop him, nobody can stop him. Nobody can stop Pogba from here. Folks, that is all she wrote for Paul Pogba and anybody who had a semblance of a chance of stopping this man. And let's be clear, Man United have played Cardiff, Huddersfield, Bournemouth, Newcastle, Reading and Spurs. Now, my grandmother, who died 15 years ago, could have managed Man United through those games and got the results they've got. And don't give me Spurs are above everybody. Spurs lost to Arsenal. That doesn't say anything about them. As far as I'm concerned, the new manager syndrome, if you, if you do watch football, you know every time there's a new manager, just like the child of divorce, everyone's on their best behavior. Everyone's giving it their all. You never see the guy's best character or true character until two or three months later. It's all lovely now and everyone feels good. But we know Paul Pogba's never had to carry a team. We know that. Not the first time at Man United. Not at Juventus. And he's never had to carry this Man United team. And when asked to, he has failed. Now imagine this situation. Everybody says Pochettino. And everybody thinks, yeah, he'll get it right with him. Now if people think Jose Mourinho was demanding... Clearly, they don't know who Maurizio Pochettino is. He wasn't the Argentina captain for no reason. Anybody who has read any books about Argentine football, everybody knows nobody wanted a piece of Maurizio Pochettino, one of the most intense men in football going today. He's going to make Jose Mourinho look like a walk in the park in terms of intensity. The problem for United is that it's clear that the players aren't good enough. It's two managers now for most of them that it's gone wrong. It's LVG and it's Jose Mourinho. At some stage, just like the lady with the troublesome son, it's not just about the husband, about the wife. It's the kids. The very first time a manager challenged them, Jose Mourinho challenged the character of this dressing room and they failed. They all shrank and they failed. What that tells you is they are not good enough to adjust when adversity strikes. All of them down their tools. You know, the famous Shakespeare saying is uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. An easy lies the head that wears a crown. Listen, leadership isn't for everybody. I can't blame, uh, blame Paul Pogba for not being a leader. That's not his fault. Either you got it or you don't. Leadership is not for everybody. And let me tell you something that makes it very clear for me that Man United have made a catastrophic error. Fine, they wanted to let go of Jose Mourinho, but they should have made an example of Paul Pogba. And here, I think, is another big reason why. People who want to be the most popular, right, are not the leaders. No leaders want to be the most popular. Leaders want the best decisions. They want the best for the team. They want the best results. They do not care about their individual brand. Never has that happened with great leadership. Not in corporate, 
not in politics, no way. Team first. People who want to be the most popular never make the best leaders. And I cannot think of a figure who cares about their image and popularity more than Paul Pogba. It's clear that football is not his main focus. It's clear for anyone who wants to see it. The talent is not in doubt. But I don't think the talent is as high as people think. And it's certainly not high enough to justify a guy who is becoming a, a manager's nightmare. He is becoming a manager's nightmare. And his talent is not Leo Messi. It's not Cristiano Ronaldo. Because you can put up with that ego. I can put up with Cristiano Ronaldo when he's given me that end product. I don't know if we've seen anything from Pogba that tells me that he's got end product. Listen, like that mom who lets her son smoke and drink in school uniform, Man United have shown Pogba that being sixth and quitting on the manager and being spiteful when the manager leaves with a very deliberate social media post, I don't think that was a mistake. And the excuses were weak. United, by not dropping the hammer big time, have said, don't worry about it. You coming sixth, you quitting on the manager, you putting out messages that are anti-Man United, because remember that was still a Man United decision, being spiteful to the manager when he leaves. What Man United have said is, Paul, that's okay. That behavior is okay. That's called enabling. And in a place like Manchester United, once that door is open, Lingard, Rashford, Shaw, Lindelof, they all see that. They all look to Pogba now, and the ship has sailed. In the short term, Man United are looking great, but I guarantee you, especially if they get Maurizio Pochettino, we'll be having this conversation within 12 months again. Because I'll say it again, if people think Jose Mourinho is hard work, if you don't know your footballing history, if you don't know what he was like and why he had to leave Southampton, Maurizio Pochettino will make Jose Mourinho as, a, as an intense personality look like a walk in the park. People think Pogba is going to have an easy ride there. You are sorely sorely mistaken i expect to be having this conversation in 12 months time with paul pogba and that is all down to manchester united and enabling him my verdict post jose Mourinho is pogba has shown his personality and who he is when you posted that spiteful message it's paul pogba first man united second and united have now set the precedent that that is okay. This is the man they hope will be the absolute king of town for the next 10 years. This is the man they hope is the leader. Uneasy lies the head, as they say. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Leadership isn't for everybody. Man United have made a catastrophic Seriously, this could set them back. I could see an Arsenal happening here. United could be, if they back Paul Pogba, it is going to be a long 10 years without trophies. Because trust me, next season, we're back here again. An easy lies the head that wears the crown. Speaking of leadership. So I love test cricket, right? Love it. Like, absolutely love Test Cricket. Spent a couple of days at the Test Cricket here in Cape Town. It was Pakistan, South Africa. But you know what I think? I think they should cancel Test Cricket. Or that they should cancel international cricket. Any form of international cricket. Cancel all of it. And I'm being very serious. Let me put it to you this way. Because this has actually happened to me. Maybe guys can relate. I don't know. Maybe girls can relate. But I'm a guy. I can only tell you something that happened to me. You ever, you, have you ever met somebody on holiday? And for me, it was a girl. 
but I know this is the, the, this is a semi true story. You met on holiday, and it was a cool two weeks. You know, summer holiday, where I live. It's uh, we, we holiday in summer in South Africa, and you hit it off, and you hang out, and everybody, you know, everybody's on holiday. It's two weeks. It's great. And then you get home, and she starts making plans for what we call a braai. Some people call them barbecues, and it's at your house with her friends all of a sudden. And this is straight from the holiday. So, so here it's like January, you know, the, your year is getting going. And then she organizes like a family lunch for your family at her house without asking you. And she like texts your mom. So now your family is invited to her house. You don't know about it. And then before you know it, your favorite hoodie or sweatshirt lives in her car. And your toothbrush and hair products are no longer in the top drawer where you keep them. Within five weeks, you've gone from happy to shopping for a, like a birthday present for her grandmother. Before you know it, she's replying to texts on your phone to your mates saying, we can't make it. Like that, that's when you know. That's when you know you've, you've drowned. When we can't make it. She's replying on your phone to your mates. We can't make it. And it's like March now, right? It's like by March, you get your first break from her. Maybe she's studying another degree and she's writing exams or whatever. You get your first break and you're like, how did I get here? Like, I hate wearing morning slippers. Why do I have those? What am I, 100? I hate morning slippers. Why do I have those? How did I get here? How did I get from, I was so happy before the holiday and three months later, I've got morning slippers. The ICC did this with T20 cricket. And now they have a serious problem. I don't think they realized that this problem was coming, but now they have it. The young players coming through, and I saw it this summer across the board, don't have the skills to play test cricket. See, there's a reason it's called test cricket. It's not like anything else. I don't think it's like any other sport in the world. It's a true test. Because I don't care if you can bat. You can be the best batsman in the world. And not be a good test cricketer. This is me. South African pitches are the most testing in the world. They are the best ball bat competition contest in the world. And if you don't have the fundamentals as a batsman to leave on length, to leave on line, and know where your off stump is, you will be exposed. That's part of the repertoire that you need in test cricket. I don't care how many fours you hit. I don't care how many sixes you hit. International bowlers will take... Will every 50 balls at least bowl you a wicket-taking delivery? And if you don't have the fundamental mental and then literally the skills to leave on length, to leave on line, you will be exposed. And how do I know all of this? How do I, like, is this all conjecture? Do I just feel like that? No. I mean, I had a look at the stats. So I'll tell you what, of the two major summer series, seven tests, Right. Three in South Africa, four in Australia. There was zero double tons. No test went to day five, session three. And the only guy that looks like, he looks like he knows how to grind bowlers down. And in cricket, if you've played cricket, I mean, I played to a, a, a higher level in school. But there's, there's a skill, particularly for higher order batsmen or uh, opening, and particularly number three and four, is you've got to make the bowlers bowl to you. That's how you grind them down. And this is, once again, you leave everything that isn't a wicket-taking delivery. And part of that, especially at international level, because the bowlers are very, very accurate, is you leave on length, you leave on line. And if you don't know how to do that, you're playing at deliveries two, two stumps, a stump outside of stump, eventually they'll get you. Pujara, Chetishwa Pujara right now in world cricket, I don't see anybody else like him. And don't say five duple C because that's just, no, don't do it. Anyway, this isn't, 
an old guy oh the world's changing too quickly what's happening with the youngsters and their hashtags i realize i'm getting old so i don't want to be that guy that's not what this is about it's not it's not oh my goodness no test cricket must stay if test cricket's on its way out so be it say lovey after what i saw this summer i say cancel international cricket because clearly test cricket isn't the priority for the icc anymore it's clear to me now how do i know that three tests isn't a series three tests isn't a series i've been watching cricket since i was four years old i know what a series is i know what it takes for teams to prepare i'm like that's almost 30 years of watching cricket i told you i'm old Three tests isn't a series, especially when you don't give a subcontinent team at least three tour games to adjust to the South African pitches of all the pitches in the world. In Australia, you can maybe give one or two because all you need to really adjust to in Australia is the bounce. In South Africa, you've got to adjust for sideways movement, so it's like having an Australian pitch in England. Especially when you don't when you don't give a subcontinent team at least three tour games to adjust to the South African snake pits. Especially when they've come from New Zealand, slow, slow drop in pitches. And you put them at Centurion and you give them two weeks. Generally it takes about a week to acclimatize in terms of the time difference. And then you still need about two weeks to prepare three tour four day tour games that's the only way to make sure that a team is ready for test level cricket especially against south africa's bowling lineup the, the south african bowling lineup currently may very well be it, it's up there with the 90s australian team it's up there i don't think it's quite that they don't have a, a, a wicket taking spinner and they had this guy called shane Warne who was all right but three matches isn't a test series what you're showing me is test cricket is no longer the priority, which is why I say it's fine. Cancel test cricket because if, t if T20 cricket is all that matters, really. So cancel any international cricket because if T20 is what matters and we're dealing with elite sport here, we are paying as fans for elite sport. Then we know that the IPL, the Big Bash and the Caribbean League are the best versions of cricket right now. Then We know that international cricket's not the best version. Why are you making us pay for a substandard product? Because first of all, in T20 cricket, not the best players play T20 cricket anyway. Because you don't need to be technical. You don't really need a captain. You don't really need a coach. It's all about hitting sixes. Who hits the most sixes wins. That's it. That's it in T20 cricket. I don't care how well you bowl the tracks are flat and the stadiums and they bring the ropes in. Cancel international cricket because three test matches is not a series. What happened in, in Australia was not a series. Neither team were prepared. Australia were horribly underprepared. Keep the ashes. That still seems to matter. But it's fading because I can see even the new Australian youngsters, they don't know how to play test cricket. My biggest gripe is the Pakistan series was an insult to the fans and worst of all to the game of cricket. Neither side had a test batsman. Neither South Africa or Pakistan had a test batsman. Hashim Amla needs to go. He's done. Neither South Africa or Pakistan had a test level world class batsman. In three test matches, I didn't see a world class innings. Nobody built an innings. Nobody wore the bowlers down. There's not one South African batsman who left on line, left on length. Three test matches is not a series. Cancel international cricket. Listen, T20's taken over and the, and the ICC don't know how to deal with this beast because the money doesn't come from them and they can't control it and they chose the money. And the thing with the ICC is once you've chosen the money, now the money owns you. Dave Richardson and his cronies 
chose the money, which is cool. But now understand that you no longer control the product. And as fans, it's an insult. And we're not going to hang around forever. We've got options now. I can watch Premier League football. I can watch NFL. I can watch NBA. There's parity there. There's competition there. It's elite. Test cricket is no longer elite. One day cricket is no longer elite. And international T20s aren't the elite version of it. Big Bash, IPL, Caribbean League. Scrap the international cricket. And I love Test cricket. I only watch Test cricket. But scrap it because what I saw this summer is an insult. Not a single double century anywhere in seven test matches. And three tests is not a series. T20 has taken over and the ICC don't know what to do with the beast they created. Listen, like the, like the holiday girl, right? Now they've got new carpets and a welcome mat and they're looking at wedding dresses just because she likes to see what's available. She's not hinting anything. They have no control of their lives anymore. The ICC chose the money. The money now owns them. The ICC better respect, start respecting the fans because I've seen this before. It's called Super Rugby. Super Rugby made the same decision and they will regret it for another decade. Once you choose the money over the sport, when you decided that five match test series were no longer the priority and you sold out to India, England, and Australia with the mo biggest debacle of a deal ever. Nobody now can help you. The ICC are at the end of the barrel of the gun. Now the money from the Caribbean League, which they've signed up for, the Big Bash that they signed up for, and even more so, the juggernaut that is the IPL now runs international cricket. Skills have suffered, test cricket has suffered, and the fundamentals of the game are eroding. It's not because I'm old. I'm saying if T20 is the new thing, the ICC must stop mucking about because to make people pay what is a lot of money, 150 rand, 180 rand for tickets, and there wasn't a single world-class batsman on display for what was, and a test didn't go more than four days in South Africa, and no test went to day five, session three at all, whether the Australian series, which was four games against India, or the South African series. No, nothing went to four days in South Africa. The ICC better start respecting the fans, and even more so, the sport of cricket, because it is an insult. Cancel international cricket. We don't need it if the T20 version is now the elite level of the sport. Give us more Big Bash. Give us more IPL. Give us the Caribbean League. Stop insulting Test Cricket and our intelligence. I'm going to finish off with the Aussie Open predictions. And I want to be honest, I don't watch women's tennis. And oh my goodness. How could he say that? I don't, because Serena always wins. And it's quite boring. Because Serena always wins. So I think she'll win. I don't know. Like, I, I really, I don't know what's happening in women's tennis. I just don't. Like, Serena always wins. She just cruises all the time. She's like playing against kids. So I do like, I do watch men's tennis attentively. I grew up in a tennis home. I was looking at the results from today. Because I watched a bit of Novak this morning. In the men's, I cannot believe that Novak, Rafa, and the grandpa Roger are still around. I can't believe Roger Federer, and I'd forgotten this even though I watched the match, is the 2018 Australian champion. Australian Open champion. Roger Federer is the Aussie Open champion. The guy's 37. By tennis standards, in, in the modern era, he's a great granddad. What this means, though, because as I called it from the beginning, Rafa's knees have given up. He's injured again. He's been injured. He's probably taking quarter zones to the limit just to keep those knees together, especially on the hard courts of Australia. 
But every major now where we have all three of them, and they are the three greatest to ever play the game, don't give me servant volley, boring Pete Sampras. These are the three best all-round tennis players of all time. And we may never see them competing again. This could be the last year. This could be the last Australian Open. Cherish it because I don't think you'll ever see this again in the history of any sport. The three greatest competing at the same time. I mean, we've got, it's a, it's a treat to have Ronaldo and Messi at the same time. But you never got like Pele, Maradona, Ronaldo and Messi at the same time. You never got that. You never got R9, Henri and Messi at the same time. That's what you've got in tennis. You've got the three greatest to ever do it. And they, they've all been at their peak and are still at a high level and still competing. So I say if you're a tennis fan, cherish that. And if I'm going to give you my prediction, I'll make it a quick one. It's got to be Novak. And it's, it's only because he's played some tennis. Rafa and Roger haven't played any serious tennis since 2018. Rafa, he got injured, I think it was in Qatar, and he didn't even make the Qatar tournament. So I don't see that happening. I saw Novak this morning back to his blistering best, and I know when he's on fire, that backhand, he hits it like a forehand. And remember, he hits the double backhand, so it is a tracer bullet. He's got the timing, the, the, the legs are looking good under him. He's, You know, when Ro, no, Novak is relentless, so his game isn't like I'm better than anybody, but he is relentless. So he's got the all-round fitness. And his game overall is probably like a 7.5 out of 10. But his mental strength is unbelievable. And he will always make you play that extra shot. It's like having a more athletic Rafa Nadal. I would say that is his strength. Rafa's got, of course, the booming left hand. And that, that topspin is just unplayable. And then Roger's just the show. Roger's what the textbook like, nobody should be able to hit a single backhand like that. Anyway, my prediction, Novak, he obliterated Tsonga today. It was, I mean, and, and Tsonga's all right, you know. hasn't been. He's not, he's not the Tsonga of five years ago, but he's all right. He can play tennis, and he made him look like a schoolchild. I can't look past Novak Djokovic. So my prediction, as we shut down the show for today, 17th of January, Novak Djokovic, for me, it is. it should be easy. It should be easy. I've had, I've had a look at his path. Novak's looking unbelievable. He's looking like Novak two years ago. Seen, it seems he settled down and he will be champion. And he, he will now be out on his own. Seven Australian Open titles to Rogers six. That is it for episode 19. 17th of Jan. Can't believe it. Halfway through the month. The FTB TV podcast. Please make sure to subscribe on Podbean and go and rate us. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes. For today, we'll, we'll chat tomorrow. The Friday Five is back tomorrow. Top five greatest defenders that the Premier League has ever had. I will give you that list. We'll talk more test cricket. We'll talk a little bit about Oligona Solskjaer and what his long-term prospects are. And we'll talk a little bit more about international rugby. There is so much more to come this week. It is Friday. Friday Five tomorrow. Cannot wait. The FTB TV podcast. Go and subscribe, like us, love us on iTunes. Until tomorrow, that is it.